Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and gosh do I have a great topic to talk about today. We're going to talk about E. coli and romaine lettuce. But before we get into that, because I had a lot of requests and I do listen to you guys when, we, when you write to me and say, why don't you do an article on this or that or a video clip? I do listen, so that's where this came from. A um, couple of things. Tomorrow is the deadline for the huge, ginormous discount on the new Food Over Medicine coaching program. So. If you're kind of thinking you want to do it, i got news for you. You've got like 24 hours to do it, and then that's it. So send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. Um, next week, on May 31st, is the next deadline, and that's for the certification package deals that we offer every spring, um, either with or without the Diet and Lifestyle course. So if you've been thinking about sports nutrition, dietary supplements, understanding psychological disorders, um, autism, allergies and asthma, these marvelous courses we have. If you're thinking about those, this is the time to do those too. So, and then of course, um, careers. Keep those emails regarding careers. I'm happy to talk to you guys and help you forge a path and all that sort of thing. And um, so anyway, emails, pampopper at msn.com. Send me an email. I'll send you information. I'll send you available times to talk and uh, let's make some magic happen helping people, okay? All right, so now let's get into today's topic. In April of this year, 2018, it was discovered that some romaine lettuce from the Yuma, Arizona area uh, was contaminated with E. coli 0157H7. According to the Centers for Disease Control, 149 people in 29 states became ill, 64 people were hospitalized, and one person died. There was no product recall. The CDC recommended that consumers not purchase romaine lettuce unless they could confirm that it did not come from the Yuma, Arizona area. And retailers and restaurants were uh, advised not to sell romaine lettuce unless they could confirm that it didn't come from Yuma, um, Arizona, and it came from a non-Yuma source. Um, one thing I'll mention is an enormous amount of romaine lettuce comes out of Yuma, Arizona. So we're talking about a fairly small infection rate. And it's concerning. However, there are some misunderstandings and misconceptions about this that I think we should pay attention to. Um, first thing is the method by which it was determined that romaine lettuce was the culprit. According to the Center for Disease Control's website, 112 people with food poisoning uh, from E. coli were interviewed and 91% or 102 of them had reported eating romaine lettuce in the previous week. Now by comparison, a population survey for 2006 and 2007 showed that 46% of healthy people reported eating romaine lettuce in the week before they were interviewed. Thus, the CDC's evidence that romaine lettuce was the cause of E. coli infection was self-reported retrospective information about food intake. And I think one thing we have to acknowledge here is that this is not particularly convincing because there's a lot of evidence to show that this type of data gathering leads to a lot of inaccuracies. In fact, um, one study of the NHANES data, data, which is all self-reported data like this, showed that according to self-reported food intake, Everybody in the United States should be dying of malnutrition due to calorie deficit in the diet, and that is certainly not what we're experiencing today. So we could say that all this self-reported data gathered by the USDA probably not telling us the real story. Now, for some background information, E. coli is a bacteria that resides in the intestines of humans and animals, and under normal circumstances, it doesn't cause much problem. The most dangerous type, which is the particular E. coli that I mentioned earlier, the 0157H7, which was implicated in the romaine lettuce debacle, is transmitted to humans by eating contaminated food. It can cause things like bloody diarrhea, kidney injury, kidney failure, and even death. According to research studies, the very young and the elderly are most at risk of infection, followed by dialysis and transplant patients and those with neoplastic disease. The risk of death increases with age. It also increases if people are resistant to Cipro and if the person is already sick with other illnesses. Antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest risk factors for death. Other studies have shown increased risk of infection for people with renal infections, bladder infections, and for individuals who have conditions for which antibiotics were prescribed in a hospital setting. Now what this really means, in other words, is many if not most people who become seriously ill from E. coli are already sick. 
Taking acid-suppressing medications increases the risk of food poisoning from all types of bacteria. And the reason is that your gastric acid serves several purposes, one of which is to neutralize pathogens before they get to the small intestine, which is where they can really make you sick. A 2017 study, including over a half a million patients, showed that those taking the drugs had a three times higher risk than the general population of E. coli infection. Additionally, the drugs negatively alter the gut microbiome, which is yet another protection from E. coli infection. So those partic that particular class of drugs is particularly risky. The risk of developing food poisoning from undercooked animal foods is much, much higher than the risk from produce. And when produce is contaminated, it's often a result of farmers growing produce on land that used to be used for cattle ranching um, and uh, dairy farming. For example, you might remember in 2007, the same thing happened with um, spinach that happened with romaine lettuce. In fact, it was a much bigger issue, more people affected. Well, the spinach that was involved was grown on land that was previously used as a cattle ranch and it was located next to a cattle ranch, an operating cattle ranch. Produce becomes contaminated when wild animals pick up cow manure from a nearby ranch and run or walk through the fields of leafy greens, for example, or when animals eliminate on the plants. As a result, some distributors have made a rule that they won't purchase from producers that don't fence in their property. Um, but this is not a guarantee because things like heavy rains and floods can watch pathogens from, uh, from cattle ranches that are nearby into the produce fields. And pathogens can be found in irrigation wells and canals, which means the overhead spraying of water that they do on the crops can sometimes be contaminated with bacteria too. E. coli is a strong pathogen, they all are. It can survive even when the so soil dries out, after which it can become airborne on dust particles, increasing its range. Cattle can kick E. coli into the air by stomping on fields and their manure, and fences can't contain dust. So fences can't contain the dust, the rain washing, the floods, that kind of thing. Before produce is sold to a distributor, it's washed in chlorinated water, after which it's supposed to be kept refrigerated. But E. coli mutates, and new strands tolerate refrigeration pretty well, which means that as soon as the produce is placed in a warmer environment, so think about this, in a grocery bag, in the back seat of your car, on the way home, um, or your kitchen counter, the E. coli will warm up just enough to start mutating and producing again. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that 48 million Americans get sick from food poisoning every year, 128,000 are hospitalized, and about 3,000 die. This means that the death rate from food poisoning is 0.0000625%. The high incidence rate of 48 million is due to the fact that most American adults are not healthy and that most of them are regularly eating animal foods, both of which are significant contributors to the risk of infection. The death rate from food poisoning is extremely low, and death is most likely to incur in people who are the sickest. So this doesn't mean that people shouldn't be concerned about food poisoning, but rather that there are a lot of risk factors that are modifiable. So what do we conclude from all of this? Here's how to protect yourself from pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. Build and maintain your health. Healthy people are significantly less likely to become sick with bacterial infections of any type. If you currently have a chronic degenerative disease, consult with someone like us who can show you how to improve your health or maybe even potentially reverse your condition with diet and lifestyle change. Be cautious about taking antibiotics. Um, our problem is overuse, and these bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, which means that if you do get an infection, the antibiotics may not work. Um, so uh, an overuse from antibi of antibiotics not only makes you more susceptible to infection, but more susceptible to serious consequences of infection. If you're taking an acid-suppressing drug, address the cause of your reflux and work to stop taking the drug if at all possible. Take probiotics to restore your, your gut microbiome. If you eat animal foods, make sure they're high quality and that they are well cooked. And for gosh sake, don't stop eating produce. I got so many calls and emails from people when this first happened saying, well, maybe I should stop eating lettuce. Should I stop eating any raw produce? Are my apples gonna kill me? I mean, people's minds go to unusual places when this kind of thing happens. And I understand the concern, but don't stop eating produce. 
improve your health instead. And I guess one thing we all should be aware of is the need to really contain these livestock farms that, from which all of this happens. I mean, you know, romaine lettuce by itself and spinach, those foods are not high risk foods in terms of pathogens. It's the nearby animal food farms that are causing the problem. So if you get a chance to lobby on behalf of getting rid of some of those, that's a good idea to do. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.